Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bitcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at Get Cell. Cell411.com. That's GetCell411.com. Are you tired of your taxes funding endless occupations around the world? Antiwar.com is run by people who understand that wars abroad become wars at home, wars on our freedoms. Antiwar.com is dedicated to bringing you the latest in news, views, interviews, and reviews from the top movers and shakers in the anti-occupation movement. Antiwar.com has it all, from thorough foreign policy analysis to interviews with whistleblowers who used to run the military-industrial complex. Antiwar, pro-free market. That's Antiwar.com. This integration of psychology is a new trend in anarchism. It is to suggest that the connections and the relationships we have with people if they're powerful, if they're strong, if they're compassionate, if they're empathetic, if they're loving, then violence is not going to crop up in those relationships. So relational anarchism is interactive in this sense. It's practical in this sense. When we're moving about making connections with people and being able to communicate our ideas and our personhood to other people, that's anarchy, right? That's the creation of rulerless, stateless societies as we move through the world in a very practical very humanitarian way. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 106th episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast. As always, we are covered by a BIPCOT no government license. This allows reuse by anyone except governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information about this at BIPCOT.org. So we are back. I am Jeremy. I am joined as always by Dave and Andre. What's up, guys? Hey, uh, what's going on, man? Uh, not much, not much. Uh, this week, we are brought to you again by Fiendphone and also again by Room for Freedom, the kick-ass new app and website from Ben Stone, the Bad Quaker, which is set to uh, kick the crap out of Airbnb because it's much cooler, accepts a lot of other options for payment and uh, cares about your security and privacy. So rock on. Check out Room for Freedom at roomforfreedom.com. Uh, so this week... We uh, have a returning guest, but it's been a long time since we've talked to him. We have Sterling Lujan back. Sterling, how are you, my friend? Hey there, brother. How are you doing? I am fantastic. Just living the good life and staying on the straight and steady. Excellent. 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 So, yes, it's been a long time since we talked to Sterling. Uh, last time we had him on was way back in the D D Danilo days when we still did video. And I think you were just talking about doing psychologic anarchists back then. Um, but since then, you've been up to doing a lot of stuff, uh, including creating your own, well, kind of brand uh, branch of anarchism, I guess, uh, relational anarchism is uh, what you've been working on mostly. And uh, I just want to uh, say in advance, uh, before we get any further, uh, there may be some background noise in the show. Uh, Sterling uh, is in a position where he, he has some he has some companies, so we may hear some things from time to time. So just so everybody's aware of that. Um, but any hoodle. Uh, so relational anarchism is what you've uh, you've been up to. And uh, I was saying while we were talking before and during our first run at this show, because uh, I screwed something up and we had to try this again uh, <laughs> about how I had I had been watching what you were doing. Doing, and I, I thought it was really interesting and I thought maybe we could start off with you uh, obviously start with definitions as we discussed before um, but start off you know just telling uh, explaining uh, what it what relational anarchism is and what you you know how, how you got started in all this and how that ties the, the psychologic anarchist your your website and stuff and what, what it is you're trying to do with this uh, to try to help I guess anarchy along and help us better ourselves right yeah, absolutely, and I don't mind explaining how the philosophy sort of works and how it came about. The beginning point, I guess, is that this 
philosophy is just referred to as relational anarchism. And I've actually been referring to it as a doctrine because it doesn't necessarily fit the criteria for a pure mm-hmm. philosophy. A lot of times when people think of philosophy, they think of something that's highly logical or that's highly structured. And the intent of relational anarchism is not necessarily to be highly structured because it is a psychologically based doctrine. It looks at anarchism from a psychological perspective and attempts to integrate psychological ideas and principles and theories into anarchism proper. The philosophy or the doctrine, excuse me, itself just refers to the relationships that we form with other people for the purposes of building and creating anarchistic communities and or societies. It is hinged on the idea that the more compassionate, the more empathetic relationships that we have with people, the more likely that we are to build and create those anarchistic communities. One of the ideas that is involved in relational anarchism is this idea of the relationalist ethic. The relationalist ethic just states that the more compassionate interactions that we have with people, the likelihood that those states, those states of being, those mental states, are naturally antithetical to initiatory violence and violence in general cropping up. And it usually comes with this question, how many times has somebody tried to kill you or murder you who you are in a genuine and authentic, compassionate relationship with? Of course, you've heard of the so-called crimes of passion, But I always say that if there is a crime of passion, then there was no true empathy. There was no true compassion involved in that relationship because somebody that you have that type of relationship with, you're not going to try to murder. That's sort of the beginning or the essence of relational anarchism. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I I could, I, 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 hmm. Uh, That last point, especially, I mean, I I guess I could agree to that to to a point, but would you even say that like, even if, because I don't know, when I think of crime of passion, I think of somebody. I guess you know, maybe this is just like you know my Hollywood, my Hollywood influences, <laughs> but right. it automatic. It, no, it just automatically goes to somebody who's been wronged. Essentially, you know, like the the faithful, the faithful, you know, the faithful wife or husband who ca- catches the other one cheating. Like the crime of passion is something like that, where it's they've been like they they've been betrayed. Um, so do you, do you think you, you think even then that somebody like didn't have it to begin with if they just if they if they felt that betrayed and acted in the moment I don't know maybe I'm yeah, going I off on an unnecessary tangent but that's just where my mind went when I heard that <laughs> right no I, that's a a good point I think that if you're a genuinely compassionate person even in those worst case scenarios oh, okay. yeah. you're probably you're probably unlikely to enter into a state of rage where you murder your significant other who cheated on you or whatever because we know that these situations do happen all the time and not everybody goes off and murders their significant other you know as a Very result true. of right being yeah, in a, yeah. that type of relationship or that type of situation and another thing that I want to mention before I forget is in regards to relational anarchism is that anarchism or relational anarchism is also a it's an apolitical statement, right? Anarchism itself is an apolitical statement. Yeah. Without rulers is a suggestion that we want to have stronger relationships with people. And politics is about what the rulers should do to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I have said that on my pages and in my feeds and everywhere else a million times. If anybody is advocating for a political solution, they're advocating that somebody uses violent non-compassionate interaction with society at large or other people. A political solution is always a violent solution that is well, devoid it's of That's right, and it's devoid of emotional contact. That's one of the big points of politics that I like to clarify as well. Well, I would agree with that. <laughs> so that's so that's the basis of, of, of relational anarchism. Now what what is your goal I guess what is the, what is the overall goal what 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 are you what are you looking to use it for more so like in regards to say our you know the the anarchist community at large or the libertarian community or, or are you trying to branch out further than that too 
Um, cause I, right. I, I think just within the community of anarchists, I think there's a lot of help that could be had. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if you need to branch out very much further, but I don't know like how, how far ranging you want to take, or I'm, I'm I can imagine you want to take it far ranging long term, but I mean, just in the short term, like what, uh, what, what how, how are you trying to implement this right now? I guess would be the, the way to ask that. That's right. That's a good question. So the big issue here is that between the different ver variety of what we call limb camps or limb axis camps in anarchism, and these are the camps that focus on the logical, economic, and moral ideas about how anarchism should function or what anarchism should look like in a hypothetical future society. The problem with that is, is that these anarchists have gotten gotten into this mental state of wanting to argue semantics with other people that actually puts other people on guard. It actually puts people in a fight or flight state of mind where they're unable to learn from each other. They're unable to communicate with any type of clarity and to get along for the purposes of resolving disputes, for the purposes of coming to an understanding with each other and finding common ground so that they can live together and build the type of anarchistic communities that they want to build. And I think so long as people, or these individuals are at each other's throats, that it's going to be very difficult to build the kind of anarchistic societies that we want to build as we move into the future. So this is why I think relational anarchism can actually be a, a label or a perspective that individuals can adopt who have an, uh, already have an understanding of anarchism, whether it be on the left or the right, for the purposes of building anarchistic societies. But it, yes, it does go further than that. I think when it comes to statists, if we can leverage this particular doctrine and form connections and bonds with people prior to telling them our particular perspectives on how anarchism should function, we will already be working them in the direction of coming to terms with yeah. anarchism through their intuitive process. And this is something that's really awesome to talk about. But I recently read this book by Jonathan Haidt called The Righteous Mind. And in this book, he said that people don't often get swayed to moral opinions when people try to bash and jam it down their throats how they get swayed to a moral opinion is through their in intuitive processes. So he had yep. this intuitive model, this moral intuitionist model that suggests that if a person feels, if they feel deeply that a position is correct, they're more likely to adopt that position. They don't adopt positions when people try to bash and jam it into their heads or to throw them on the ground and start kicking them and beating them, so to speak. They well, pulling is a whole lot easier than pushing. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Right. So it's this emotional strain that gets people involved in anarchism. And there's actually some research that Haidt suggests in his book that people are more likely to respond to emotional states in regards to any type of moral judgment that's being passed on that. One of the studies actually was pretty interesting. They had people talk about their moral position in regard to a certain type of issue. Let's just say abortion. And in one situation for the primary group in the experiment, they put them in an area where there was like some stinky decaying fish in a garbage can just a couple of feet away from them. And their moral position changed or it was influenced negatively because that stinky foul odor was right there. But if they were in an area that wasn't, and this was the control group, then their positions were almost more positive. So this is suggestive that our moral functioning in our mind, our psychological framework is highly determined by environmental cues. It's highly determined by our own past experiences and other Social factors. Stress, uh, that, there's a lot that, of that. that yeah, oh, there's yeah. a whole, yeah. that, then there's a whole bunch the cultural, of variables. The cultural morality for sure is definitely a nature nurture thing. That's right. I wanted to I wanted to mention because we talked about uh, or you mentioned semantics, um, and I do think it's an important point to make that. I mean, I understand. I, I do agree with you that we should try to relate to people and convince people through intuition, and this is why appeals to emotion are so prevalent in our society now, and why we see so many of them, especially as 
anarchists and voluntarists and whatever other label we want to use, we see appeals to emotion all the time from statists. You know, if, if anything from, oh, well, you know, children are just going to be uneducated to, uh, you know, consumer electronics are going to explode in your face without without the state. Right. <laughs> right. It, it appeals to emotion are, are what people resp- generally respond to if they don't put a lot of critical effort into their thinking, which is that's, that's right. not to say that there's anything wrong with that. But I do want to mention about semantics. If you want to build these relationships, or at least this has been my experience. Um, if you want to try and build relationships with, um, I do think it is vitally important that we define terms prior to trying to engage with people, because if you're trying to engage with someone intuitively and they start to understand, like they start to kind of get the message that you're sending, but if their definitions for words are different than yours, then they might be going off on a completely different tangent that has nothing to do with anarchism. You're Does that make on sense? Two different railroad tracks sitting there arguing about a railroad track that neither of you are on. Uh, right, you know right, and that's like we were saying about defining terms being you know vitally important, which it is. Anytime you have a conversation with somebody where you're trying to to come to common ground or to like you know analyze different positions, if you have different positions from that person, you you have to you establish some sort of commonality. Of Right, you have to establish some sort of commonality or some, you know, common rules, a baseline. So that way both of you are on the same page because if you guys are not on the same page, if you guys are in two different books, it's really not going to matter the conversation you have because you're going to be talking past each other essentially, right? And I'm sure we've we've all had it. We have all talked past other people in our our time here trying to convince other people about the non-necessity of the state so I, I, I just Dave wanted to I mention that past, because i think that's that's really important dave and i talk past yeah. each other on a daily basis <laughs> oh yeah no, no 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 yeah totally totally <laughs> yeah i think one of the key things i want to mention here and you're absolutely right when it comes to the point where we're having a discussion that's more intellectual or abstract talking about the specifics of the definitions is of utmost and imperative importance however i would also state that Whenever we have a conversation with people, whenever we just try to connect with people, that tends to come before there's any type of logical or intellectual argumentation that really requires more stringent definitions of terminology, right? Because when we interact with our wives or our significant others, we're not constantly wrangling over definitions. We don't say, will you define love for me? Whenever we talk about love with our wife, we don't say, this is a straw man argument that you're You've presenting right never now been at my because you're trying table, to <laughs> touch my penis or whatever is going on. So, well, yeah, but well, but to, yes. to speak with your significant other is a little bit different than to approach somebody that you have no, no, you know, interaction no, no. with or no relationship with. I, sure, well, I mean, I'm just. It depends I'm, on what. If, the, I'm if, sorry, I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt that. that, that I think that it all really that. depends on the terms of the relationship. <laughs> well, all I'm well, trying yeah, to that's suggest true. is that's that true. is that we get. And I'll say this briefly. He's correct. That's generally not going to be the, the the deepest case. I did go off a little bit on the deep end with that particular <laughs> analogy. But all I'm suggesting is that we first, when we try to make any type of in contact with people, and I'm really interested in Martin Buber's perspective on this because he suggests that we should go into this I-thou relationship with people rather than the I-it. And that requires us to actually have an encounter with people, whether it's online or whether it's in person. And that is generally... And I use this very sanitized idea of intimacy with other people. We try to converse with people, try to understand people, connect with people. So the definitions are involved in that to a smaller degree. But other than that, it's just a conversation. The the more that you're trying to get people to define their terms, especially when it's involved in an argument, that's what a lot of times creates escalation. But it's not just, of course, defining their terms. Also, there's some other types of nastiness and defensiveness. I've, I've noticed some that, people so. want to keep a lot of stuff up in subject subjectivity land and never want to really define terms concretely because if they did, they would have to have no argument. Well, okay, and but, but they would have to go to their second implication of, I'm going to aggress upon you if you don't accept my premise. <laughs> right. I think you're kind right. of missing the, the point, though, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I was yeah. just gonna say because I, oh, I, I, when when you were when Andre when you were talking before before Andre responded, I, I and as I, Andre was responding, I, I was trying, I was kind of thinking, I guess along the lines of what I, I I thought you were talking about, Sterling, that and Dave just kind of bypassed that and jumped right back into the arguments and definitions of the terms. Um, the fact that you like 
that is the first line in in a debate. That's the first. That's the first. You know, that should be step one in any debate. But what you're, I think, what you're talking about is 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 before the debate. It's before that even occurs. Just trying to have a conversation, not even necessarily about differences of of opinions. You it. Uh, more yeah. more so you about about finding commonality and how, like even not about like liberty or anarchism, just about like maybe music or 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 art or whatever it is. Just finding something you can connect with and actually build some kind of interim relationship right there before you even get to those discussions. Am I, am I right about that? Is that, that's yeah, kind of, that, okay. Th- that's right. And let me validate that point with some things that's been happening on my personal Facebook feed. This is how dead, dead set and dead pan, if you don't mind me using that phrase that a lot of anarchists are when they try to have a conversation with me because they don't have a mindset of having a conversation. A lot of time their mentality is already dominated by the it's what i refer to as the fight mentality the argumentative fight mentality i will just be having a conversation and not wanting to get into the argumentative elements just yet and they will already start throwing out this idea that i'm committing a fallacy when i'm trying to say hello (laughs) how are you doing today i haven't even made a claim what are you talking about right (laughs) Yeah. Can't, so we can't even get past step one. And this right here is the the primary point that relational anarchism brings into play. You're not going to create many more anarchists if you try to condemn them of committing some type of fallacy or otherwise attacking their character or becoming immediately defensive before you even get into the conversation. And one of the cool things about this, just mentioning another person, I think Larkin Rose is all is also attempting to work from similar areas in this with his candles in the dark little talks that he's wanting to have. I'll, I'll mention that briefly, but yes, that's what's happening. You can't, if you can't have a conversation with people, if you can't just try to connect, how are you ever going to have a decent debate where you can really come to terms with the semantics, with defining terms, with having understanding and actually building the anarchistic societies on a practical scale that we want to build because there's this relational anarchist idea I put forward is not a totally abstract theory that I've tried to pull out of the nether void for the purposes of <laughs> bamboozling people or being some type of esoteric spiritualist. The idea is to get on a practical level with people. And one of the most practical things about humankind is that we're a social creature who really enjoys relating with others and having connections and interpersonal relationships because it's how we were. It's in our DNA. It's in our genetics. This is this idea of attachment theory. And we can talk more about that later if we want to get into some of the quote unquote theory. That's the you're right. And Jeremy nailed it. That's the point of this whole process and procedure. I had just to start talking to people. Not not necessarily talking about pe- talking to people about anarchism, just talking to people. Sure, just just having a just communicating with people. And I'll say this: even when it comes to anarchism, and say you're talking to a a left anarchist and you're a right anarchist, there are still things that you can have common ground in automatically, where you probably already have an understanding of each other's definitions. So that does help if you can well, get on that common right ground this, first. You're kind of right in this thing, Sterling. Where if somebody doesn't see you as a friend or at least uh, not a foe they're most likely not going to accept your premises or your definitions or anything that's coming out of your mouth right yeah no well that what's going to happen and we know this neurologically this isn't something that's just guesswork or again some spiritualist granola nonsense (laughs) what we know from psychology and, and and neurology is that as soon as we try to talk to people we don't know and we want to get in right into the debate and, t- and tell them that they're full of shit, well, the fight or flight response kicks in. The brain is flooded yeah. with a neural hormone called cortisol. And cortisol, cortisol at high levels, especially on people who do this a lot, and we know a lot of people in our communities who do this a lot, and they get triggered a lot, and they attack people a lot, and they bring up this notion of tossing people out of helicopters a lot. <laughs> well, what that does, it those higher levels of cortisol over time actually in impair learning it impairs protein synthesis in the brain and actually shuts down our ability to connect at all with people and to learn for both in in both ways so literally literally arguing with people with this defense mechanisms properly in place is a waste of time and it is really detrimental neurologically i think i i I think i had i 
I think I had all of that got it got out of me when I was younger. Yes. I used to be this like just stark raven, crazy lunatic, like conservative red, white, and blue, turn the Middle East into a <laughs> a parking lot kind of guy. You know <laughs> If it ain't America, I don't give a good goddamn about it. You know, one of those guys. Uh well and, well, uh, and actually go ahead, Dave. Go Sorry. ahead. No, you go ahead, Andrew. Well, it's I, I like that you mentioned that because, and I, I wanted to bring this up because uh, you know, uh, it's we've talked about this on the show before that a lot of people don't necessarily cling to you know political or apolitical beliefs very strongly. They generally respond to social pressure. Most people are followers. Um, it's like we have mentioned before. <laughs> really, well, I know sure. you, I'm me, the worst. And Jeremy and Sterling are not, but most. Well, that's people, how I that's got out of I, the conservatism. That's how I got out of being conservative. I I'm one of these guys that love being right almost more than I like having any opinion of of my own, and I could not stand the fact that I could not beat the system with conservatism. It just would not work. It would. It's never going to work, even if this huge populist quote-unquote right-wing fascist swing we're seeing right now is not going to work it may band-aid for a little while but it's not going to work uh, it's okay. this once you become a logical thinking person all it takes is someone coming along and saying your arguments are wrong here's why i wish you would look at them rationally and you'll look at it rationally because you're not enraged because you're on this quest for knowledge because you also want to be able to tell other people the truth and you stay in this thing where you're like, hey, this is where I'm at right now. I'm wide open to other stuff, but this is where I'm at right now, and I can solidly defend this. But, but, okay, but you know? again, you're back on the, you're back on defense again, Dave. You, <laughs> well, everything, even even <laughs> no, no, the, everything. You realize you're the type of person that we're that that, that Sterling and I are describing, right? You, it's oh, you, I'm Dave. A debater. You, you, I'm a you, debater. You're like, you just keep, I know, but you just keep like proving the point for us. You just keep drifting off to there. I mean, I get what you're saying as far as like you know, you, well, you thought you were over that stage. I mean, we've talked about that extensively on the show as well, that the, the angry anarchist phase where a lot of people get stuck. And I, you know, I went through it for a very long time. But unfortunately, I, I think even more people by get past the all out anger stage, but they still hold on to this as Sterling was describing this need. And again, this is something I know very well of myself up until even fairly recently, I finally got myself past doing this on a regular basis where it's just you're always in fight mode you're always looking for the next fight you're always looking for the next person to prove wrong you're always looking for the next in most cases in this in the community in the circles we travel with and caps and such looking for the next commie to smack down whether figuratively literally or you know as a show for everybody else what like that's that's the mindset of a majority of the people that I used to consider friends, all of a sudden that is reared like that is what I've seen. And that's it and it's on on all sides. It's in all camps, as you know, and that's the problem. So when you would keep wanting to talk about defending this logic stuff, believe me, you know me. I'm I'm all for that. I'm one of the most I like to think of myself as a very logically thinking person. And I've been told that my entire life, long before I came to anarchism. It used to drive people insane. I was called a robot. Um, but long before I was an anarchist, most people just assumed yeah, I didn't have any emotions too. because I, I, I just yeah, thought I tried to think Strangely things enough. out. Even I mean, though I can, I can passionately defend my, my subjective opinions on, you know, stuff that doesn't matter, but in logic land and stuff that's like, yo, these are clear, de clearly defined things. This is what this means. I don't know why we're drifting into this. But again, can we not agree that this is what this means? But again, we're that's, talking that's about like before we can even discuss or even I'm the opposite of like 99% of humans. I like before I even consider even walking up and being a friend with somebody, I got to do a logic check, a brain check, a, a debate with them almost to see how they can even handle rational discussion. And which is I'm why you a weirdo <laughs> and it keeps a very few amount of people in my life though. So I don't suggest and You know what? I think that I think for the especially under the guys, you know, under under the under the topic we're talking about, that might be a good thing that you keep very little people in your life because we're not going to get anywhere if you keep more people in your life, Dave, because you're 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 here openly admitting that this is the type well, of person you are. It's so not about we, though. It's about but, an individualist but, movement, you know? No, but you're missing the point, Dave. You're, you're, you're automatically shutting. You're, you're, what you just said there is essentially saying that nothing, Ster, what, what Sterling's doing is nothing you could actually get on board with because it's the, antith it's the antithesis of you. 
<laughs> you just described hey, the exact opposite that, of what Sterling's trying to accomplish. The exact opposite. That's why I advocate above all the attack from all angles aspect. I have my uh, pass. I've chosen. I understand. Okay, forget it, Dave. Anyway, let's. Well, let's, one of the one of the beautiful things about <laughs> Dave, and Dave and I have had conversations before. Dave has what I call some particular areas of thought, which some people would call very zany and highly illogical when it comes to psychedelic drugs and other chemical use. So in that regard, that is already an area where I can relate to Dave and have an understanding when yeah. it comes to compounds in the way that, say, Terrence McKenna described these experiences. So in some some regard, all of us have a little bit of these zany, irrational, highly emotional elements but it's really just a matter of leveraging those elements and attuning to them and using those to talk to people and to connect with people. So in this sense, even Dave, I think, can understand the relational elements and the connective elements and where we come from in those regards. And I think of, that's of course. very, very of course. important. <laughs> of course. I just, I'm horrible. I view every discussion, everything, every interaction with another person as basically like a game of risk. Well, you and don't have to I, call I, yourself horrible. <laughs> <laughs> you I, I'm, I'm not the norm. I'm not really not like That's everyone right, around me. Them. Always, they're just always like, "What is wrong with you?" <laughs> well, so. I, yeah, I definitely empathize with both what you and Jeremy were saying, <laughs> and even Andre mentioned it briefly in the very first article that I wrote around the time that we had our first interview. I mentioned or I talked about my coming of age story in anarchism. You know, I had been arrested for possessing MDMA and cocaine and I had to go through the whole status rigmarole where it felt like I was zoomed up or beamed up to the alien spacecraft for the anal probe because that's the kind of raping that I got <laughs> by the state. And my reflections on that, in that, I remember being very bitter, very angry, and how I projected that anger and that bitterness was through the conduit of logical argumentation with people because you know I had contact with Stefan Molyneux in his video series very early on in my career and so this logical perspective this moving getting out of the emotional self that I had this dispossessing myself of emotions and just being straight up logical and wanting to argue with people was my way of not dealing with those emotions, was my way of not trying to understand myself at a deeper level. And so I projected all of that hatred that I had of myself and that I had of what happened to me onto other people, but I characterized it or slandered it, if you will, as the logical argument, as the best logical argument. And I remember during this time, I pushed a lot of people away and I pushed a lot of family members away. And at the time, I was proud of that because this was the logical perspective. If you're not with me, you're against me, right? Mm -hmm. And I definitely had this us versus them mentality. But guess what? If we embrace that mentality, we are actually enjoying or joining in on what the state wants us to do, on what individuals with power want us to do. It's this notion of divide and conquer. So if we can be against other people, yes. if we can consolidate ourselves within a particular function of, of being and relating to other people, well, then we've already just given up. We've already shown our hand and there's nothing else that we can do to get other people involved because well, now they just absolutely hate our fucking guts. Yeah, yeah you're right. And it is part of this, almost like we, we need to give this idea to people instead of trying to bash them over the head with it. Hey, here's the idea of anarchy. What do you think about it? Because the, the divide is between those who want masters and rulers and those who do not wish to be ruled. That's the divide. That's the real divide in humanity. You can really splice it any other way. Uh, whatever you're wanting to call someone, it usually it de de devolves into they want you enslaved or a master over you or the opposite. Yeah. They don't want you to have a master. I, I think right. that's, well, yeah. I think that's easy to say for us because, you know, that's how we think. But I think there's plenty of other divides that are a lot more significant to a lot more people uh, that may <laughs> that may take exception. But no, no, no. Anarchy is that realization that there's an issue there that humans shouldn't try again, to violently yeah. and aggressively control each other. But it's I, not the right way to do it. It's not moral. I, I know, but again, I know you hate morals. It's not about it's not about, it's not like about hating morals. It's about the fact that it's it's just that you keep you keep skipping ahead to like the more of the end game type stuff, 
Whereas you know we're you know Sterling's whole idea of just trying to get, is trying to get there first. Oh yeah, you got to break that ice before you can even give anybody these ideas. You're right. Talk, and this talk is, to somebody about. Some, I don't know why some people are bashing Sterling for it. Talk, I, I I still haven't understood it. Talk talk about talk to some people about some Alabama football or something instead of right. talking about. about well, I can tell you why. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, it's, go, go ahead, go ahead, Sterling. <laughs> well, I was going to say I know why some people are bashing me for sure. There's there's two classes of people that I've seen. One class of people is a class that just doesn't understand what I'm saying, and this makes sense because a lot of people in the anarcho capitalist movement in the is specific, and I specifically say anarcho capitalist not to pick on these folks, but it's because where I come from, and it's still my personal preference, right, in terms of economics and logic mm-hmm. and morality. But the issue is is that a lot of them probably had similar experiences to me, maybe not quite to the same extent, but. Because of those experiences, they've pushed away their ability to relate to other people. They have abolished or ablated their own humanness, and now they just can't figure out how to relate with other people in a way that makes sense, in a way that the other person can attune to them. And so that is a a definite issue in the anarcho-capitalist movement. There's a lot of hate. There's a lot of pain and suffering and turmoil that needs to be dealt with on a personal level, and this is the issue here it needs to be a part of anarchism it needs to be considered as part of our plight but that's why they just don't have an understanding of emotional content what it means i've had the luxury of going through a counseling program and having to have my emotional content put on display and to become very vulnerable in front of people that i did not know and had no connection with whatsoever and that has been a boon to me because it's allowed me to really understand that aspect of myself and to have glean some insights in regards to how I approach people in terms of anarchism. So that's one issue that we're dealing with now. The, there's the lack of emotional connectivity. And I just want to mention this briefly before I move on to the second class of people. But this, what this issue is, is causing, what this lack of emotional attunement is causing, it's, it's part of what creates the statist environment, right? Because the state as an organization, as a symptom or is a symptom of lack of emotional connections in childhood, of squashed emotionality in people in general. And that's why everything the state does, and this is to loosely quote Vladimir Nabokov, like for instance, he said he hated warfare and bloodshed, but there was nothing more that he hated than the fact that war, warfare and bloodshed is just an administrative detail. So whenever anything is just an administrative detail, that means it has been had the emotion sanitized. It has had the ability to connect, rend apart. It had the soul removed. So there's no more humanness. That's right. There's no more humanness there. There's no more ability to connect. When the soldier steers stares down the other soldier with well, that's a, what the state well, does, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. That in the banality of evil. Yeah. That yes, yeah, that is the exact that, that's, well, it that turns was, us all into one. little bitty ants that it, it doesn't matter if you died in a war, it was for the betterment of the state. And it's like, there's no emotion. And then they want you to remove this human emotion and attach the, your human emotion to the state. And that's, so that's a big folly. So what's the, what's the second class of people you were talking yeah, about, Sterling? Yeah, the, so the second class of people is people who probably have an understanding of it, but they're also thinking way too logically. But they do have a little bit of emotional content in themselves and they do have an understanding of emotional worlds so and these are the people who are a bit more sophisticated and what they're trying to say that is wrong with what i'm saying is that i'm not compartmentalizing that relational anarchism is not part of the anarchist movement that what i'm advocating is just and only a strategy and this is sort of a this is more of a semantical type of argument or an argument to say that let's be so it is an argument in general it's just say let's you're just not being part of the anarchist movement you're talking about something else is essentially what they're saying but in my mind just this integration of psychology is a new trend in anarchism it is to suggest that the connections and the relationships we have with people if they're powerful if they're strong if they're compassionate if they're empathetic if they're loving then violence is not going to crop up in those relationships. So relational anarchism is interactive in this sense. It's practical in this sense. When we're moving about making connections with people and being able to communicate our ideas and our personhood to other people, that's anarchy, right? That's the creation of rulerless, stateless societies as we move through the world in a very practical, very humanitarian way. 
I, I think it's a great approach uh, as, as long as it's to get in there and build friendships first before you're even trying to pull anyone philosophically down in your direction. And that's, I, I think people are, since that motive from other people, I know, unless I run into another, someone who's like actively looking for a debate, when you're trying to push a, a, a philosophy down someone's throat, they're going to reject it because they have no basis. Of a friendship, right. you're right here. You're right on this, and everyone's oh. saying you're wrong on this. I don't agree with them. And I, of course, Dave, I take it even a little step further. I think that what happens, and everyone is free to disagree with me on this. This is where I really take it out into the onto the next level. But I believe that if we're really interacting with people relationally, if we've accepted relational anarchism as the appropriate path to creating anarchism, maybe alongside philosophies like agorism then the left or the right paradigm completely dissolves and is obliterated, right? Because if you have a connection with people, you're going to be able to solve any type of economic problems that you're going to have without ever having to fantasize about how society should function on into the future. There, there wouldn't be a need for an economic spectrum if there would be no one using aggression at all. I see what you're saying. That's right. So the compassionate element is antithetical to aggression anyway, right? If you if you if you love your neighbor, right? Hi, good neighbor, like Mr. Rogers, then <laughs> then you're going to be accepting of that person. You're going to figure out how to solve your problem without shoving a gun in their face and telling them you're going to abide by what I say. But this all requires that we return to this attachment state that we had as very young children and where we had an idea of what it was like to be loved and adored by our mothers and to have the connections with the people in our life because you know that's always go ahead no i i, I think people here in this are going to jump to this logical they're going to make this logical jump well sterling's saying you shouldn't defend yourself from uh mm -hmm. you know economic uh, trespassers or whatnot are are you shouldn't do uh, i don't think i've ever heard sterling say that well of course i don't think i've but, ever yeah, heard and, sterling I, say and that. i didn't and i didn't get that at all and i i had some idea because i haven't really been paying that much attention lately i've had a lot of stuff going on in my personal life so i haven't really been paying too much attention with what's been going on um but yeah i didn't i didn't get that at all all uh, my understanding is if you can be, if you can act compassionately towards other people and other people act compassionately towards you, then violence is really becomes a non-issue because neither of you would want to resort to violence in the first place because you've already developed a, a sort of empathy with the other person. And empathy pretty much empathy is one of those things that precludes violence or at, at the very least t tends to mitigate the desire to rely on violence. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. Yeah, I, yeah, I I totally understand that. And, and a volunteer voluntarism is the end goal that we all strive for for humankind. I mean, it wow. like if if this is the gift that we could give humankind, I don't, that would be epic, amazing. Yeah, the, the four of us maybe. I don't know so much about the rest of the people out there. Um, even even in our community, <laughs> I don't know if that's their goal. Um, but that's I, I think that's you know that's that's part of the problem though is that all all these. In the, a lot of other people are in the, are still in that fight mindset, so it doesn't, you know. And I think, that, at least from what I've seen from you know from the sidelines and watching how you know Sterling and people like him and other people and even myself to a certain extent get attacked for saying certain things or or stepping further outside of the box. I mean, I, I mentioned this the other um, was it last on last week's show or or some or some other show that I did recently. Uh, I think it might have been our Patreon episode that we that I put out recently, where I think a lot of people have kind of, especially in our community, have have come to this position where they think they've they've stepped out of the box and they're you know they're 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 thinking outside of the box but in reality they've kind of just turned themselves around and now they're facing the other they're in the opposite corner but they're still in the goddamn box because it's still this very like you know i've i've called it uh you know residual statism um but it's 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 this very black and white thinking that still remains and that's it's part of the logic thing i mean we've been which is the threat you know thread we've been talking about through the show where people just want to like a, a certain percentage of the population wants to jump to that automatically and i know as as somebody who did that for a very long time uh, i know that instinct um but it, it just bypasses everything else and it it it, it just anything that's outside of the accepted <laughs> philosophy that that 
this particular person has adopted. In group preference. Yeah. Well, the outcome. Right. Yeah. Right. Is is automatically has to be something else because it's it, it they've reduced everything to everything is black and white again, and it's like no, wait a minute, wasn't I the think whole that's idea the beauty of a voluntary collect? But wasn't that the whole idea of people? You know? Wasn't that the whole idea of getting out of the status paradigm and coming into and and and, and becoming a more yeah, free thinker where things. you're you're open to more ideas, but now all of a sudden you've quickly shut back down and you're back in black and white thinking again, and it's either wrong or right, or you know if you're like like uh, I think a couple of us said the you know the with us or against us you know idea. It's like, well, yeah, okay. Unfortunately, even if you're right in certain instances about that, it's still not going to get you very far. And that's the problem. I mean, that's the overall problem I've been seeing, which is, I think this is, I think it's, I don't know, it, maybe it's a, a smaller component of, of the overall issue that Sterling's talking about, or maybe vice versa. I don't know, but it's, it's this being so convinced that your theories are correct and the theories that, that, that build, that, that are, that, that build up your ide particular ideology are the correct ones that you completely detach yourself from, from reality and forget that you're not actually putting any of these into practice. <laughs> so it doesn't matter how right you are, which comes back to you still need to try to build bridges with certain people to, to in order to get into a position where you can even attempt to put your ideologies and your theories into practice on a larger scale. And how are you ever well, going to get there if you're just constantly looking for a fight with everybody and constantly determining that just because somebody thinks a little bit differently than you, even if they agree with you largely on, you know, say 80 to 90 plus percent of your, the, of the rest of what you agree with, all of a sudden you've now been placed into, an, into, a, into a, a different camp because they need to yeah. pigeonhole Well, yeah, you. but if they agree with the 80 to 90 percent of the, of the fluff... Whereas they disagree with the ten percent of your core philosophy, that's a really large hurdle to get past. That's not something that no, no, you no. say, "Oh, well, you know." But I'm not not, I'm not a big deal. You know, we agree on most things, but just not the important things. I'm not talking like, about that, fluff, though. Though I'm talking about I'm talking about agreeing largely ide ideologically speaking. Just having certain like it's become because of this fight mentality that seems to be so prevalent in so many people. And like I said, only up until, you know, the past six to 12 months, I, I would count myself in that camp as well, where it's just you're looking for a fight all the time that it, it's even people that are in your camp largely if they all of a sudden start t talking about a different thing and trying to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe should we think about this instead? It's like automatically you're a commie now. It's like, dude, no, no, you, that's not how this works because, because people aren't willing to have conversations. People just want to yell at each other and they just want to, they just want to think in this black and white world. And that's, like I said, I mean, I, I think I started saying that in the, in the first, in the first go around of this, this the show that we tried before, um, you know, I've detached myself largely um, from a lot of groups because I just, I don't want to, I, 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 I'm trying to observe, but it's just, it's getting crazy because there's no point in talking to so many people because most people are not willing to have conversations anymore about anything, much less about anarchism. They just want to argue and like Sterling well, said yeah, before, you're not going to find that in, in the echo chambers for sure. That, that I think a lot of people suffer from staying in echo chambers for sure. And unfortunately for us, we orchestrate a few of the echo chambers and it can become tiresome because you see the same things over and over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's like, a, it's like I've, I've mentioned this somewhere else before. As long as nobody's trying to threaten violence from at me from the get go, I will talk to anybody. So. I mean, the, this the, what we've been talking about relational anarchism. I think is a great way to relate to people who may not be aligned with you or may not be on the same philosophical footing as you in order to try and build bridges. Which, and I'm all about building. I want to build bridges with as many people as possible. I will open myself up to whoever wants to have a conversation, provided that that conversation actually goes somewhere. Because it's it's. It's like it's like what uh, you were talking about, Sterling. Empathy, like empathy, you know, it, it's a it's a two way street. Like it can't just be one person being empathetic and the other person shutting it down because then it doesn't work, right? So I think I think if we we were all on the same page with that, I think we would go a lot farther. So yeah, I I agree with that. Yeah, I, yeah, I agree with Andre there. So I I just see on the online community, especially, I see a huge lack of sincerity when people. Even when I'm being or being my trying my hardest to be as sincere as possible to other people, when I ask them questions or try to talk with them or engage with them, 
they just it's like no sense of sincerity at all from them and i think this sincerity has been lost on social media like no one gives a shit anymore it's like hey i'm just here to argue i don't think and you guys are right a shit on social media <laughs> well and one of the things i want to I, I want to point this out because this is a very important thing to remember are the camps that we create based on these logical principles are also very fickle, right? We've realized that as anarchists, as anarcho-capitalists, if that's what you identify as with just within the last year, because there's been this, this exodus or this di diversive, this camp that has diverged from the other camp into this alt-right segment that is claiming to be what would entail anarcho-capitalism, right? But now there's these ideas that border control is necessary, that Trump might be a good guy, that helicopter rides for communists and anybody that disagrees is necessary, and the idea that the echo chamber should proliferate has been solidified in these camps and that no communication is allowed whatsoever. So one of the problems that relational anarchism addresses is this idea that harboring these very strong ideological positions have a tendency to implode from the inside out within the camp. If we don't have a humanitarian level to relate on, then a lot of times these camps might digress into something ut utterly fascistic, right? That's always something we need to keep in mind that because of the nature of how humans tend to interact and how logical arguments can be very easily adopted to other positions, possibly highly authoritarian positions, we always have to keep that in mind. And this is the very, very important aspect of relational you, and compassionate. You, Go ahead. Do you know the, the angle that we're trying to play with the re relational angle, the relational anarchism is going to play more to less rational thinkers, more emotional thinkers. And that's in going to entail essentially more leftists, you know, on the economic scale, the, the physical removal, hop, hop, Pinochet, whatever that's appealing to the right wing people. It's pulling them down towards the anarchy spectrum. And a lot of left wing anarchists really aren't, they're missing the boat on that. Just like a lot of the right wing anarchists are missing the boat on trying to reach out emotionally trying to do these things instead of hey we're gonna throw you out of a helicopter because you know like when a nazi hears a libertarian say hey you're just a communist to us and you're gonna get thrown out of a helicopter as well they're like i don't want to get thrown out of a helicopter i want to be with you guys and then they're like well i need to read about these guys and then boom they're done they go down the, the, the rabbit hole so it's like it's a mimetic way to pull people towards our camp and a lot of people aren't seeing that at all a lot of people aren't well, I don't I don't, actually I don't agree that that's what's actually happening. I think what's just being created is more divisiveness, more hatred, more ideological mongering. And we see this through the way that these folks have segregated themselves from other people based on their alt-right ideology. Now, don't get me wrong. There's probably a small segment of the population who may respond to the these these essentially thinly veiled threats of violence and come over to the side of anarchism that we want. But I don't think that that's the majority of people, and I think that we know that psychologically, based on the defense mechanism study of neurology, that that's what's actually going to happen. Because when people hear that they're being threatened with their life, even if it's as a thinly filled joke, their defense mechanism kicks into gear, the cortisol starts flooding, and they want to segregate themselves from you and be as far as away from you as possible. But that doesn't even also doesn't even have to happen because a lot of these people are self-segregating because they believe that they're so right in their particular vision of how society should function that they have just started blocking people on social media or not dealing with anybody in their lives whatsoever. So they're isolating themselves and creating this veneer of almost a sense of sociopathy in the fact that they don't want anything to do with any other in-groups except their own particular logical agenda, quote-unquote logical agenda, and whatever ideas that they have on the plate for how well, society should function. I, I think very few people realize the, the level of down the rabbit hole, me, you, Andre, Jeremy, a few other. There's very few people that would even ascribe to voluntary or voluntarism at all. Uh, much less, you know, you, you count the subcultures or whatever inside of that. So, like, it's it's very tiny group of people, and that's why it looks so important and so big when a few people step 
away from groupthink or uh, an ideological um, endless repetition. They sway away from it. Uh, right. My hope is that even if that does happen, you know, even with what you're saying, Dave, my hope is that I, I really even want to try to connect with some of these folks who are going into this direction, this splinter, these splinter cells of this alt-right particular movement, I really try to connect and work with them and talk to them as well, just like I would any other party or any other group. This particular group is very difficult, though, because a lot of times they just block me and call me a Marxist sympathizer and be done with it. And that, of course, goes back to what we were talking about. Well, earlier. exactly. You're a commie because your ideas don't align exactly with mine. And that's the no, that's the well, black and white I, I rigid would, thinking. No, that but that but that is the that is the the very. I, I see it every day. I'm not disagreeing. I see it every yeah, day. I see just, exactly what he's saying. But I, I agree I with you, Dave. So see the exact opposite on the other side as well. Uh, I don't know about the exact opposite, but <laughs> I see I see that. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been told to go kill myself by. Uh, Avowed communist. So yeah. Oh it, yeah. It totally happens. Oh, in that regard, time. sure. I, I didn't mean it like that. Yeah, no, like that I get. I'm just saying, it the the. But but those the people that do you that. You know how like uh, the, but, the but, libertarians but, are like saying helicopter now the people, or whatever. The commies are saying gulag. Okay, but, online but, but, and, and, but, and but, okay. Right. forums and wait, stuff. Wait, what were you saying? Wait, what were you saying, Jeremy? Sorry, Jeremy? But those people, those type of people, aren't any different than the people that Sterling was describing they're just they're just engaged in the horseshoe that they're 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 playing out the horseshoe theory in real time that's what that's what they, they're they those type of people they're all like he like Sterling said at the beginning he wasn't trying to single out in this specific instance he was talking about oh no he yeah started to start caps no, but I yeah oh well, yeah anybody who anybody who does that they, they're all the same type of people that we've been discussing this entire time that have this mindset of very it's a very black and white mindset they've come to conclusions about whether they've actually come to these conclusions or they just, they've been told to come to these conclusions essentially um, it doesn't really matter they've they're at that point now and they've convinced themselves that that's the only thing that that's correct and everything else is bs and most of the time every everybody else who doesn't conform to exactly how they think is the exact opposite of them even if it's the furthest thing from what that person actually is like you know calling me a commie um regularly um or calling sterling a marxist sister a marxist sympathizer it's like I, right. I, I would, Jeremy owns his own business, uh, self-employed. He's. I, yeah, I am one. I am one of the. I am one of the. I am one of the. He would be the first motherfucker strung up if the commies took over. <laughs> I am one of the few successful anarcho-capitalists, even though I don't even I don't know associate with that uh, title anymore. But I am one of the few people out there who actually has a successful business, unlike most of the ANCAPs who run around, who I think are the mo some of the most horrible capitalists I've ever met. Um, they don't. <laughs> they don't know how to do it very well. Um, so. <laughs> You know, but that goes largely for most people. Most people don't understand how to, they, they don't understand how easy in a lot of regards it really is to just, you know, go do your own thing and say, fuck the state. And, yeah. See, and one of the really, that's a, you know, valid point for, for sure, sir. I, I guess I wanted to add to this whole particular discussion right here by saying this is one of the problems that relational anarchism is starting to solve because I really think before these particular ideas came into the fold, this type of stuff wasn't even discussed that often, but I think it probably took this a lot of these divergences. And the reason that I talk about anarcho-capitalism probably more is because that's where I come from. That's most of the people who I have on my feed. That's most of the people who I associate with. So it makes sense that I would talk about particular movements in regard to this aspect of it or this movement of it in relation to relational anarchism. Right. Yeah, I think it's gonna, we're gonna we're already seeing some of the this activity and practice through the compassionate anarchy group that I've created, and so that is definitely going to help out. It, I think it already has helped out a lot of people start to realize. Whoa, hold on a second! I've been in this this brain drain situation where I'm just wanting to argue back and forth with people all day long, and it's achieving absolutely nothing. And we don't really have time, I don't think, tonight for it, but there's a, a practical element of this that's cropping up in various segments that is reliant somewhat on relational anarchism. But that's a lot of these practical agorist freedom cells that people like Derek Bros are actively creating 
And in these freedom cells, there is not always a distinction between economics between the people who live in them. And that's very important to keep in mind. These people realize that freedom from rulers, as in the state, is one of the first and foremost ideas that need to be handled in a practical way. And so these folks are starting to get together. They're creating their their co-ops. They're creating their live-ins. They're creating their own space for trying to work together to use the black and gray markets as in the counter economy to create freer societies. And Derek, if you follow his feed or have ever talked to him, he's just about to go on a very large tour. I think it's the decentralize your life tour where he's going to actively work to create more of these decentralized freedom cells where there is not a focus on it being left or right per se. And as you guys know, Samuel Konkin, the creator of agorism, was also in the mindset that he wasn't just leftist or rightist. Agorism was a philosophy in its own right that integrated theory and practice. That was both path and goal to creating freer societies. So that's a, a bit about where relational anarchism comes from as well, but it's just the psychological counterpart to agorism. Don't, don't 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 tell don't tell the Trump archists that because they've all convinced themselves that you know Konkin was this hardcore leftist and agorism has to be leftist. <laughs> yeah, that's funny that a lot of these guys say that uh, that Konkin was a leftist. I just finished reading his agorist. They've never read or, Konkin at all. Right, they, that's true. They haven't not even touched his book. But the agorist primer, he states very clearly at the beginning of the book that he pretty much accepts elements of capitalism and communism but doesn't necessarily classify himself as being part of either one of these yep. labels or either one of these economic agendas and he just wants to use the counter economy and to live outside the scope of the state to create the free societies that we want to live in to solve the problems that we may have economically Adv after the fact in a free market environment Ad advocating voluntary markets is uh that's anarcho capitalist <laughs> So. Yeah, it could be considered that. Capitalism specifically defined as just uh, private ownership over the means of production. And so that could or could not be in an agoristic society, depending on the particular economy sure. and the individuals involved or the co-op involved. But there's a lot of different ways that, that can pan out. Yeah. Now, it is very possible, and I'll say this with my anarcho-capitalist background, mm -hmm. that in the end, the watershed philosophy that's adopted could be a private property based one for sure. And I think that some of that may iron out depending on the individuals involved and how they talk to each other and how the communication works out. But I don't think that that's something we should worry about now per se, I which is what relational based, anarchy is about, uh, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good point. Maybe we just don't know how, it, Dave, good point. We may not know how it irons out. Those terms may be irrelevant, created irrelevant by technology. That's yeah. A good point. Uh, yeah. Everything, you know, tomorrow, everything could be, you know, everything just boom. Right. Just one thing could come out and change the way we have to look at all these variables. Right. That's right. Because a blockchain based company wouldn't be centralized anyway. And that would make the communists happy and capitalists wouldn't care because there's still profit flowing through the blockchain. Right. Well, if you had your well, deeds and all of your property uh, titles yeah, and everything say, on the blockchain, it would the, be the inarguable. Ownership. It'd right. be in order to who owns what. Right. That's well, I just want to say in this element, what we're talking about now doesn't have anything to do with relational anarchy yeah. per se. We're talking hypothetically about in the future based on technology and based on how people yeah. interact and what happens. But yeah, absolutely. That's this is a that's always an important aspect of it, especially when you're talking about agorism and how that's going to function in the future. Could yeah. function. I mean, look at what Bitcoin did just for agorism. Like imagine if Konkin could right. have thought about Bitcoin, you know? Oh, well, good as, goodness! As, as, right. as, as we discussed on our was it our last episode when we talked to Shane Radliff about the uh, yeah the, the idea about Roya about about the idea of Vanu about which I, which actually yeah Rayu which actually had a lot of the elements of agorism but was like t a decade ahead of Konkin. Um, but a lot of people don't know about him. But it's the same type of you know same type of idea because I mean Rayo wasn't a like as as Shane told us Ray, Rayo wasn't even an anarchist didn't necessarily say you know anything about being an anarchist, um, and it was just you know the type of idea of creating agorist type communities what i mean what did he call them uh something enclaves i forget now um <laughs> oh ethical enclaves. ethical enclaves thank you um but yeah but so again and i i think 
that that type of thinking is is does definitely fits more in line with with I guess with what Sterling's doing with with relational anarchism because it is about building bridges with people not and not caring about the economics until later. Let's just get there first, you know. And, right, and it's already it's already happening. Like in Houston with Derek Bros's Free Thinker House, yeah. Derek does not think he's completely on board with relational anarchism. Talks about it, has quoted me in his last book. But the, they have this understanding, him and John Vibes, who is the co-author in their Manifesto of the Free Humans books, that these freedom cells are going to crop up and there's the economics is going to be a moot point in regards to how it's going to be based on how the freedom cell members interact and how they work out a community based defensive system mm -hmm. in these freedom cells. And this is a beautiful, brilliant, practical way to bring people together. And if they're leveraging relational anarchism within these freedom cells, that's just more power. That's more of a dynamo for creating the type of societies we want to create in the practical here and now. Yeah. I can't wait to see what happens in the future as more of these little communities start to crop up and start to build their own type of societies. And a lot of what these folks are doing are doing everything to step outside of the state and the power structures, what, whether they be crony capitalist or whether they be status based, you know, because a lot of times they'll create their own few, their own food. They'll have skill shares. They'll use decentralized services. They'll use mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies. So we see yeah. it moving in this trajectory without anybody ever having to invoke their abstract theories well, on how the economic. I like Derek a lot. Yeah, yeah. We should we should have to try to get like Derek, Derek on lot. to talk about that too, because that. I rec I re yeah we, I recommend getting him on. He's a good yeah. buddy. We me and him both agree on this that the future is going to belong to who can decentralize everything, make yeah. it decentralized, make it uninterruptible and make it to where no one is in complete control of it. That is the future. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'd like to agree. I, I think, I think, well, that's, that's what, that's the future. I'd like to see. I know that much. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to see a news source that was uninterruptible, uninterruptible, no way it could be shut off. Well, there's, there's, I mean, that's, I mean, I think we talked about that at one point. That was the whole idea that, uh, you know, uh, Michael, Michael Dean, Michael W. Dean had for trying to get the, the centralized DNS up and running on, on Bitcoin, off of Bitcoin. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, they, they, he you know, there was an app, uh, for Android that they banned in China because they set up a, a mesh network with so many cell phones that it was subverting the Chinese government so bad that they had to ban it at the app store. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that, but so a mesh net of cell phones could be set up anywhere. Oh, uh, that I, right. well, I, 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 I had a, I got to work with a mesh net when we were at Porkfest. That was cool. That was my first experience with that. Yeah, those things could be set up anywhere. So yeah, uh, but that's yeah. that's that's a whole other topic. We could we can continue talking about that. <laughs> then uh, I, I, yeah, yeah, we I need to get the wrap in. Yeah, we should probably. Yeah, get I was about to say before, before we go off into a whole other tangent. Uh, but this this has been a really great conversation, and I'm I'm really glad uh, you had the time to come on, Sterling. And uh, obviously, before we get going, I would give you the chance to have any last words and then of course plug anything uh any and all of your uh, sites and stuff that you want to plug right well i want to say right off the bat that this has been one of the most productive podcasts slash online audio driven conversations that i've had in a long time because it's been the first time that someone's asked me questions specifically in in an audio format where we could discuss these very pertinent ideas to our times and how the anarchist movement is evolving and where we're sort of heading with our thinking in regards to these ideas. And I think this stuff is all going to be super important because things are changing. And I'm actually, and I'll plug this right now, I'm working on my book at the moment and I have made some posts about that, but it's just going to be called tentatively The Anarchist Awakening hmm. Relational Freedom for the Modern Age and what it has to do with anarchists coming to terms with themselves and who they are and how this is going to function on into the future and how what anarchism is going to look like in order to bring more people in. So I think this is super mm -hmm. important. These are the type of discussions that are going to have to be had between anarchists because our movement is growing so vigorously. It's very clear that there are it many is. more anarchists right now than there ever have been in the history of humankind without ever me having to cite any numbers unless I want to cite some Facebook pages. But it's all because of the Internet and technology that our voices have become began to boom and to resonate in society at large. And that's super, super important. <laughs> so yeah, in the end, I, yeah. well, we can make some last, I want to just plug my sites real quick sure, for ahead. you guys and for the audience so they know. So psychologic-anarchist.com is my website where I write blogs constantly on a regular basis, psychologic-anarchist 
on Facebook is the Facebook page, and you can find me at Sterling Lujan, L-U-X-A-N, on Facebook. And I also write full time for Bitcoin.com, and my articles appear almost daily, but they're news-based journalistic pieces. And yeah, I think that sums it up. But before we got get going, just real quick, in like ten seconds, easiest way to buy Bitcoin with USD for all the listeners. I know the answer, but you go ahead. Easiest way to buy Bitcoin with USD? Yeah, sign on to Coinbase, create a Coinbase account, and then you can buy Bitcoin instantly. But you have to put your credit card on there. That's the quickest way mm-hmm. I know. Yeah, that is but still the quickest it, it, as far it, as I know. And my and my my suggestions are download the Mycelium wallet and transfer all your money from Coinbase to that. So it's always a Coinbase intermediary. Coinbase is the best. Anybody wants to get involved in Bitcoin and is a beginner, Coinbase. You if you follow and plug your card, your personal card. You know you have to give some person a little bit of personal information, but if you do that, they'll sell you Bitcoin instantaneously with yeah. that. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. what I've used to purchase Bitcoin. Yeah. It's fantastic service. I believe they even take PayPal. All, now. all problems aside, but yeah, that's a fantastic service for purchasing. Yeah, yeah, especially if you want it in a hurry. So. All right. <laughs> yep. Uh, yep. Jeremy, all he needs is <laughs> he always needs his Bitcoin I'm, in a hurry. Listen, man, I'm just I'm, I'm sitting on mine right now. I'm 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 com- I'm comfortable. Hold it, me. hold it. Wait till the French election, everybody. If you hear my voice, hold it. Don't sell oh anything my God. until Dave, Dave, David okay, has five million and one right, predictions. That's that'll tangents, Dave. Yes, tangents, so. tangents. All right. All right. Thanks for coming on the show, Sterling. I really enjoyed it. Look yeah, this has been one. a pleasure. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, this was great. Thanks, guys. Oh, definitely, man. And uh, we'll definitely have to we'll have to have you back on and uh, talk some more because uh, we could we could, we could go on for hours. Yeah, about there's this. plenty of subjects. I think last time I talked about psychiatry. We can do that again too. Yeah. That's fun. Always oh fun yeah, topic. I'd love to do that. Excellent. Oh yeah, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. All right. Well, so yes, this this has been a great conversation. Thanks again, Sterling. This has been the Seeds of Liberty podcast. All of our information can be found at that nap violating website known as the seeds of Uh, we have our Patreon account there. Please, uh, consider donating a few shekels to us. We are putting out more content on a more regular basis. So what is it? Uh, patreon.com slash seeds of Liberty. And, uh, we will catch you next time. Peace. Peace. Peace in the Middle East. Oh, that'll never happen. Want caviar sound on a cat food budget? Creamy Radio Audio by the Freedom Fiends has great free tips so you can sound like a pro without spending like one. The most powerful form of human communication is one person speaking to another. But if people have to suffer through your sound, they'll change the channel and miss your message. Creamy Radio Audio will help you speak to the world with sound that will make people want to keep listening. Check out CreamyRadioAudio.com. That's CreamyRadioAudio.com. Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows use or modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org.